All right, everyone's favorite energy and equilibria, and of course, thermodynamics. So the laws of thermodynamics talk about the flow of energy in a system um, and the ability to do work. Um, so these are actually from physics that we can apply to ESS in several different ways. Um, and then we also talk about equilibria um, in this understanding um, or this significant idea. Um, so there's different stable states that you can exist in. Um, and then there's tipping points, which could lead to basically different ecosystem states. Um, so here we can see uh, an aquatic system um, that increases in nutrients might actually get a growth of different organisms. Um, so especially in ponds and stuff, if you add lots of fertilizers, you could get a bloom of algae um, and then actually create an entire different uh, ecosystem. And the water actually will turn from really nice blue to a really kind of mucky green. Um, so there's a tipping point there as you increase that nutrient load. Um, great video here that I'm pretty sure we've watched in class, um, but worth the view again, talking about um, different feedback loops in nature. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics is more commonly known as the uh, law of, or the principle of conservation of energy. Um, basically, in an isolated system, um, we can transform energy, we can transfer energy, but we can't actually create or destroy it. Energy has to come from somewhere and it has to go somewhere. Um, it just can't be created out of nothing, basically. Um, you can't get something for nothing, right? So if you actually look at this, we have energy coming in from the sun, and then you'll see all of that energy goes somewhere, right? Even though only a portion of it's absorbed by the land. If you add up all of these numbers, they'll eventually add up to 100% um, because the total energy input should equal the output. Um, and then you also see this in food chains, right? Um, so as we consume food, we use some of that energy in respiration and running around and living our lives. Um, and then some of that energy actually is consumed by other organisms that might eat us. Uh, in this case, us just referring to all animals, hopefully not humans, but uh, maybe you might get eaten one day, I hope not. Um, but if you do, they would only get a certain percentage of the actual um, food that you had consumed, right? So you consume however many, um, many joules of energy or calories of energy, and then you use a lot of those calories in your everyday life. Not many of those calories actually go into making um, meat that, that someone else could eat. Um, but again, if you add up all of the numbers here, right, the total um, result should be um, the 20,000 here. Probably is not going to be the 1.7 million because a lot of this sunlight, as we saw in the previous slide, is going to be reflected by clouds, absorbed by the atmosphere, um, absorbed by other things, etc. But basically, all the inputs are going to equal the outputs. Um, and again, because of that use of energy, because of respiration, we only pass on a, a certain percentage, generally about 10% of the energy that we consume actually gets passed on to the next trophic level. Um, so this is actually why you tend to see so many fewer top predators than you see of uh, smaller animals on the food chain, right? So we see tons of insects usually, usually lots of rodents, uh, but maybe thankfully not tons and tons of snakes or tons and tons of mountain lions. And that's just because there's really not enough energy that gets passed through the food chain. Um, and so again, you can see here in an ocean ecosystem, we tend to have even longer food chains. Um, so the 10% rule is, is often even more extreme um, in ocean settings. Um, so the second law of thermodynamics really is, it's just about inefficiency, right? It's just like no system is gonna be completely efficient. Um, you're always gonna lose some energy in some way. Um, so again, this plant has actually used a lot of respiration before the caterpillar could even eat it. Um, but then once the caterpillar does eat it, it actually uses some of that plant um, energy for respiration. Some of the plant, it actually just poops right out, right? That's totally wasted, not helpful at all. Um, and then again, with um, electricity too, if we're generating energy, um, we're trying to turn turbines, which move, um, usually use magnets to generate electrons and electrons is actually electricity. Um, and so you need to generate heat to turn those. But of course, some of that heat just sort of goes off into the environment. You can't make something perfectly insulated. You're always gonna lose some of that heat. So you're gonna waste some energy. Um, or for example, right now my computer is plugged in. Um, so I have my little charging box, which is actually, oh, it's a little bit warm right now. 
Um, so that warmth is energy, right? It could be electricity to charge my computer, but it's actually heating up, which is just going to be wasted energy. So not in a 100% efficient system. Um, so that's basically the gist of the second law, right? I'm never going to be 100% efficient. There's no such thing as a, um, oh, what do they say? Like uh, infinite motion machines or whatever. Um, and then of course the 10% rule, we're only getting 10% of the energy um, from the previous trophic level. Um, and then so equilibria, uh, really this is a kind of a study of like inputs and outputs, how um, different factors in a system change um, and how they kind of interact with each other. Um, and really this idea is directly connected to negative feedback loops because negative feedback loops will help maintain stability um, in an ecosystem. Um, so we can see here um, a negative feedback loop keeping the temperature the same in your house. So as it warms up during the day, um, the temperature will um, sensor on here and then it will actually turn on the air conditioning and cool your house. Um, and then vice versa, when it gets too cold, um, it'll sense and then turn it on to heat it up. Of course, we do the same thing with our own bodies, except with sweating and shivering to change our temperature. And then you can see negative feedback loops in predator prey populations as the number of rabbits spike. You actually see a spike in predators directly afterwards. Um, and then, of course, they eat a lot of rabbits. So the number of rabbits drops and then the number of predators will drop right afterwards. And then you have a good year without many predators. So the number of rabbits goes back up. We're going to go back and forth. Right. Um, we have a situation at the start and then it's actually reversed. That's kind of the negative aspect. Right. It's. Um, decreasing the initial change. Um, it counteracts deviation, keeps things in balance. Versus a positive feedback loop, this is gonna be an initial change that continues to increase. Um, the snowballing effect is a great example. Positive feedback loops are usually bad. There might be a few cases where they um, can actually be helpful. Um, but a uh, positive feedback loop um, so for example, if you start to become hypothermic, you're too cold, you actually start to lose brain function and you think you're actually warm. So you take off your clothes and you actually get more cold and then you become even more hypothermic and you become even closer to death, getting a, a feedback loop there, um, a positive feedback. Um, and then of course, there's lots of concern of positive feedbacks with climate change. Um, say as more ice melts, the ice reflects less sunlight. So the earth absorbs more sunlight and so it gets warmer and so it melts more ice and then it absorbs more sunlight, et cetera. Um, so resilience of a system really depends on those negative feedback loops to keep things in check and in balance. And those feedback loops can really um, be helped by a really complex system. Um, so we see two examples of an ocean um, food systems here. Um, one of them that's very simple, right? Only kind of one uh, organism at each level versus a more complex one. And you can see in this one, if we lost the ocean sunfish, we would automatically lose the two sharks as well. Versus in a more complex system, if we lost the sunfish, there would be other options available. Though, of course, as you start to take away more pieces of this, it becomes less resilient and you could reach a tipping point where the whole um, situation could collapse. Um, and then in real life, it's even more complicated than most of the drawings. Um, so here's an example here where you can see the, the primary consumers and our herbivores, grazers, uh, the secondary consumers and the tertiary consumers here. Of course, the tertiary consumers eating um, both grazers as well as other carnivores. Um, this would be uh, the lion, I believe, panther leo. Um, and then of course, this would be our um, producers, autotrophs, the plants that are making their own food. Um, worth pointing out to the different um, plant communities you actually can see here. So a grassland and a woodland, of course, which you know, uh, riparian referring to those areas near waterways. Um, and this is probably specific to the local region since it looks like a, a local name. Um, and then the size and storages, the diversity also really helps um, with resilience. Um, so um, with, with the size, right, you think about um, places like um, the Galapagos or Mauritius where the dodo lives. And those places are so small that they don't have a lot of resiliency. And so they're way more susceptible to extinction um, and to uh, ecosystem decay um, and other damages um, versus a larger system, which can take more damage just because there's more space. 
Um, and of course, humans affect the resilience of ecosystems by reducing that, right? If we started to cut down the forest, we're gonna start to take away those connections, create little patches and, and isolate things. Um, a lot of these feedback loops take um, a long time. So there's lots of delays. So that makes it even harder to predict what happens. Um, but here's some examples of feedback loops. Um, maybe try to identify if they're positive feedbacks or if they're negative feedbacks. Um, and then here's another connection between desertification, basically when a landscape will change from maybe a forest or a grassland actually into a desert. Um, and that can be, you, know, you actually saw that during the Dust Bowl of uh, the 1930s. Um, and again, some sample IB style questions. How did the laws of thermodynamic connect to ecosystems? So in this case, we see the same amount of energy going in um, as is lost in different ways, right? So if you add all these up, 990 plus 10 plus nine plus one plus 0.9 plus one, that should equal 1000. Um, oh yes, yeah. So if we add it right here, that's a thousand. Um, and this 10 joules going into the, um, well, this actually looks like a European elk, I reckon. Um, that 10 joules, nine of it's lost to the environment, one of it goes to the lion. And of that, um, point 0.1 stays as the lion if someone else is going to eat that lion, whereas point 0.9 is lost. Both the second law of thermodynamics here and the first law in that both of these equal the inputs, right? The outputs are the same as the inputs at each level. Um, and then talk about resilience in variety of systems. So you could think about, um, you know, more complex areas tend to be more resilient than our less diverse ecosystems. A uh, nice little um, visualization of a tipping point here, right? Um, where it actually, once it hits this point, it just tends to fall really quickly into a new state. Um, so in the rainforest, we might lose enough trees that there's not enough trees to support or create enough rain because actually the rainforests create their own weather um, through evapotranspiration. Um, so maybe you lose enough that they don't create that rain anymore and then you don't have a rainforest, which would be very bad. And again, you can find the link to this slideshow in the description.